All right, folks, this is Alonzo, the Godfather of the West Coast Hip Hop, with another, another legendary interview for the podcast. My man, Mr. K-Day himself, the Mac Attack, Greg Mac. What's up with you, Doc? Alonzo! What up? People don't know, man. You're the reason that we were successful. You People don't know. Let's tell them. Let's tell them. Let's tell them. We know what, Doc, it was a team, it was a team effort, man, because... Uh, we're going to go back for a minute. We're going to go back. We're going to pat you on the, on the back in just a second. But right. when, when I met you, I had just shut the eve after dark down. And I was nervous as shit. Police cut, they gave me a hard time. Old man shut the eve down. I moved to Dudos. I moved to Dudos. About, I was opening Dudos right when I met you. You just came to California. Mm-hmm. I, I always give her, give her her props because she still helped me out today. Rochelle Lucas, my, who was my sales rep, Say this guy's coming in from Texas. He's going. He's probably going to be the new program director. You need to meet him. And we went out. We hung out. Went to lunch. And uh, we ain't been. To, we ain't ate a lunch together since then. But that's all right. We made history in the meantime. Okay. And we we hit it off. You saw what I was doing, and you immediately. Uh, you got it. You got it. And between what I was doing in the streets and what you was doing on the airwaves, gave the West Coast hip hop a foundation. Uh, I think it was a perfect storm, just like this, this, this situation with the COVID and the, and the, uh, the George Floyd situation was the perfect storm of events that led us to where we are right now. And I, I, I set it up, and I'm going to give it to you, because you, ha- you see, we both shared the same history, but you had a different seat than I did. Now, for your seat, what did you see? Well, you know, I didn't, I was real naive to, uh, LA and what was going on in the streets and uh, you know all I knew was Uncle Jam's army was kicking ass and I wanted to uh, be a part of that and they didn't want me to be a part of it and so I said well I'm a, I've always been one of those kind of people that you know you can tell me no but you ain't gonna stop me right and, uh, I just got blessed to be able to run into you and of course you know you uh, introduced me to Dr. Dre and uh, we figured out how I could help you get your venue happening, do those. And, uh, and, and I, I could have access to the streets. And so it just kind of all worked out, you know, just kind of all worked out. You know, when, when you, uh, before you came to town, I was paying to bring acts to Eva at the Dark and do those, whatever, or Eva at the Dark, actually. And you started giving me acts. You like, you gave me uh, Jermaine Stewart and Climax. And I think one situation happened, man. New huh? New edition? New edition? New edition. I was saving that for later. Uh, okay. <laughs> we, I mean, you brought LL Cool J to do those when nobody else would mess with him. And he got booed at do those. People don't, people don't understand that. He wasn't always the lovable cat. You know, in the beginning, he caught hell at Compton. Okay? Mm-hmm. He caught hell at Compton. Um, don't I don't know what happened. Now here's here's a bit of history that was really crazy. When LL came to do those was the first time I did not I was not on duty that night. I left because Wrecking Crew had his first show up in Sacramento. So we didn't we did I wasn't there. I set it up. I think I might have hired somebody else to do the sounds. My girl collected the money. LL was there and I called back that night to see what happened. She said, oh man, they didn't like him at all. They booed him. He, uh, you know, I think he had on some blue or red. I don't know. He should have had on, if he had on blue, that might've been the problem. That's why they booed him. <laughs> huh? That's why they booed him. They booed yeah. him. He became in wearing blue or something like that. And he was talking all this high powered stuff and nobody was checking for him, man. And it, it, it made for an interesting event. And I, that was short. at that time, that's when Wrecking Crew was taking off with records and touring. And that's why I left Dudos. And um, but nonetheless, man, up until then, dude, we was killing Big Six, man. Mm-hmm. You know, you had us on the radio. We're doing the, the traffic jams. Now, where did you get that idea from? Now, see, here's the thing. That well, the traffic jam. Uh, I wanted to do something different in the afternoon. People on their way home, and so, and I should have trademarked that name, right? Yeah. Um, but because all radio stations use it now, a lot of stuff I did, a lot of stations use it now, which is all cool. That's great. Um, what we did is uh, because I wanted to create uh, something to go up against Uncle Jam's army. And uh, uh, I even tried stealing Bobcat away. But Bobcat, you know, he, he was loyal to his crew. 
but he said, you know, why don't you call yourself the Mix Masters? Now, this was after what we had gotten going because before the Mix Masters, it was Dre and Yella. And so I'd asked Alonzo, I said, look, man, um, you know, I need some DJs. He said, well, use mine. I said, are they any good? Are they good? You know, Alonzo said, I think they're the best. Okay, let me hear them. And uh, so I remember Dre and Yella coming up to the station with their cassette and uh and they let me hear it i was like oh my lord i it wasn't really a mix it was a song it was a 30 minute song right where because you know in your garage in the back because i went over there a few times hung out with the fellas they had the multi-track i think you had what an eight track four track four track four, four, four track okay uh it sounded like eight but they would you know dre would actually lay the beat down and then he'd do the mixes over the beat it, it was just, it was a production. I never heard nothing like it. So we put it on the air. It was an instant, instant hit. And so I made a deal out with Lonzo. I said, look, station ain't going to give me no money to pay y'all. But they'll allow me to promote your dudos. And so that's kind of how it started. You know, I would say, oh, yeah, don't forget to check out Dre and Yell at Dudos this Friday, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the groups, you know, I was a music director at the time, so obviously they wanted to be my friend, but they would always ask me, you know, hey, can we do a promotion with you guys? Can we do a promotion? So we started making them 1580K day promotions. So we, you know, uh, would bring the groups out and perform for you. And we even took it a step further. If you remember, we started broadcasting live. Right. Uh, Friday Night Live is what we called it. Right. Uh, and it just exploded, man. The place was packed. It was wall to wall. Me and Lonzo was just sitting over grinning. <laughs> you know, we was just like, yes, yes, we done made it happen. You know, we, we just, uh, it was just, you know, huge, hugely successful. The pro only problem we had is because Dudos, for those that maybe aren't from LA, Dudos was in a blood territory. And so a lot of the Crips wanted to go see us, but they weren't going to go to do those. So we had to start moving Friday Night Live around the World on Wheels and uh, Sherman Square, Casa Camino Real. Uh, you know, Sherman Square we'd go to because the Hispanic crowd didn't want to go anywhere else. The Casa was kind of neutral territory. Three, two, one club, if you remember. Right, right. We did that because that was for the white people that wouldn't go to none of the other people, right. the other places. So everywhere we went, it was for a different race, uh, basically. And uh, uh, I just owe that all to you, man.